Of all the elements on the periodic table, gold is probably the most popular. There are reasons for that. It's heavy, it's shiny, it's one of the best conductors of heat and electricity, it shields radiation, it doesn't rust or tarnish, it looks nice in jewelry, and it's rare, really rare, which makes it valuable. And as a result, it's been sought for, fought for, and frankly, bought for a lot of money. The pharaohs in ancient Egypt valued it so much, they were buried with it. The early Spanish explorers were obsessed with the Aztecs' abundance of it. It inspired at least a quarter of a million people to move to California during the 1849 gold rush. It's backed most currencies throughout the world for most of history. And it's been recognized as the highest standard, the gold standard, if you will, from gold medals and gold records to gold stars for when you're being good. Gold is one of the most sought-after elements on Earth. But again, it's rare. Really rare. I mean, the likelihood that any of us might randomly find a gold nugget on the ground is, well, let's just say you might stand a better chance of winning the lottery. And while it's not impossible, gold is generally found in very small amounts, usually in large mining operations that most of us wouldn't have access to anyway. So, simply put, finding gold naturally, on your own, is not very realistic for most people. But what if there was another way to obtain gold? I mean, other than randomly finding a gold nugget on the ground. What if you could do something like, oh, I don't know, make your own gold? But how would you do that, you might ask? That story starts now. Throughout history, people have learned how to combine different things together to make new things. For example, the early Egyptians learned to combine mud with straw to make bricks. The early Mesopotamians glued strips of wood together at different angles to make plywood. As people became more advanced, they learned that by combining iron and carbon in the right amounts and at the right temperature, they could make steel. Nowadays, chemists combine different elements all the time to make new and useful materials. These materials have become part of our everyday lives in the form of fabrics, plastics, alloys, and other compounds, as well as various liquids and gases used throughout the world. Most of us probably don't realize just how much of our modern day life depends on chemistry. Chemistry is the science of combining different kinds of atoms in different ways to make billions of different chemical compounds known as molecules. For example, let's take hydrogen and oxygen, which are two different kinds of elements. If you combine them correctly through a process known as electrolysis, you can make water, also known as H2O. That's two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. That all seems simple enough, but the question still remains, how would you make gold? And has anyone ever done it before? A long time ago, people called alchemists believed that it might be possible to turn lead into gold. They thought that by combining the right elements under the right conditions, it could be possible like combining hydrogen and oxygen to make water. Lead and gold do have a lot of similar properties. So one might see their logic, but unlike water, gold is not a molecule. It's not a combination of different kinds of atoms. Gold is, in fact, itself an atom. Well, what difference does that make, you might ask? Well, it's probably helpful to understand the difference between an atom and a molecule. You see, molecules are composed of atoms. They're mixtures of atoms. It's kind of like playing with Legos. Atoms are the individual Lego blocks, all with different shapes, sizes, and colors, and what you build when you snap them together is what we would call a molecule. Changing molecules into other molecules would simply be like unsnapping Lego blocks and then snapping them back together in a different way. Seems simple enough. However, changing the structure of an atom is no small task. That would be like taking a single Lego block and melting down the plastic to form a completely different Lego block with a different shape, size, and color. As you can see, that's not so simple. Unlike gold, lead is a very common element found throughout the Earth. But ironically, lead has a very similar atomic structure to gold. In fact, the only difference between them is that lead has 82 protons and gold has 79. So in theory, you would only need to remove three protons from the lead to turn it into gold. That doesn't seem so hard, right? Well, maybe not on paper, no. But we have to remember that the process of removing a few protons from any atom is tougher than we think. I mean, it requires splitting up the protons in the nucleus of an atom. You know, splitting an atom. A process we call nuclear fission. 
And that, my friend, comes with its own set of unique challenges. The alchemists of old had a good idea, but they just didn't understand enough about physics to realize the complexity of what they wanted to do. Nowadays, the idea of turning lead into gold seems crazy to most people. They generally understand and accept that it's not really possible, right? Well, it's not exactly impossible, or at least not anymore. But how, you may ask? How does one accomplish this impossible yet possibly possible feat? It's easy. All you need is some bismuth, a particle accelerator, and a quadrillion dollars worth of energy. Let me explain. In 1980, three scientists, Glenn Seaborg, Walt Loveland, and Dave Morrissey, wanted to see if they could do what the alchemists of old could not. They wanted to see if they could make gold from another element. Instead of lead, however, they decided to use bismuth, which, like lead, is also closely related to gold on the periodic table. However, due to some of the unique properties of bismuth, they felt it would be an easier element to work with. So how did they do it? They used a particle accelerator and shot beams of carbon and neon at a piece of bismuth for about eight hours. A particle accelerator uses magnetic fields to accelerate particles at nearly the speed of light, and then smashes those particles into other particles, which can create new particles. That's a lot of particles. They do this to help solve mysteries about physics and better understand the universe. Glenn Seaborg theorized that if bismuth had 83 protons and gold had 79, they should be able to shoot enough subatomic particles at the bismuth atom to potentially knock out four protons. And that's all it would take to turn bismuth into gold. It's not a bad theory, so they tried it. And after eight hours, they succeeded. Kind of. I suppose it all depends on your definition of success. They did actually turn a small amount of bismuth into gold, so for all intents and purposes, yes, it was a success. But to be clear, they shot the bismuth nearly all day, and the amount of gold they produced was so small that they weren't even sure if they could detect it with a mass spectrometer. It was so small, in fact, that they claimed that by using this method, it would cost nearly a quadrillion dollars just to produce a single ounce of gold. I'm no financial expert, but that doesn't seem like the best investment to me. Especially when you consider that you can buy a regular ounce of gold on the current market for only around $2,600. Now, we do need to acknowledge the fact that this was an impressive feat of science that no one had ever been able to achieve before. And to that, we applaud these men and the knowledge gained from such an incredible effort. But despite the success of this experiment, it's obviously not a realistic means of producing gold. In fact, the time and cost of doing it this way makes owning your own gold mine much more practical. And it makes the idea of finding a gold nugget on the ground seem like a real possibility. But given the odds, I think the best bet might just be to go and buy that lottery ticket after all. <laughs>